I'm Gian DeLeon, and this is K11 Conversations, a podcast where we discuss the intersection between creativity, culture, and innovation in line with K11's social mission to incubate talent and propagate culture. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Claire Allen Johnstone, the project curator at London's Victoria and Albert Museum, the world's leading museum of art, design, and performance. Dr. Alan Johnstone works on the V&A's Britain Galleries, 1500 to 1900, and was part of the editorial team for the book Silk, Fiber, Fabric, and Fashion, published by Thames and Hudson in 2021. We'll discuss K11's love of couture, artisanship and fashion beyond time, the capsule collection from the V&A offering a glimpse into the history of fashionable British and French women's wear from the 1830s to 1960. This collection from the V&A tells stories about topics like the importing of goods through colonial trade, technological advances in clothing production, and changing social and gender norms. And we're here with Dr. Claire Allen Johnstone. Thanks so much for taking some time to uh, join me today. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Great. So tell me a little bit about this exhibition. You know, it really just tells a story about fashion and the change of women's wear over time in terms of silhouettes, colors, and textiles. What would be the through line that you would describe this exhibit as having? To talk most in particular about the kind of historical garments which are inspiring contemporary designers also featured in the exhibition. Fashions were just changing super quickly in Western Europe across the period covered by the V&A items in the exhibition. And that date range is 1830 to 1960, essentially. This is a time of huge technological development. We are in the Industrial Revolution era. And also there are other things happening, like, for example, the fashion press is really taking off, which means that fashions can spread and change super quickly. I think it's quite interesting to look at textiles first, because, of course, the textile comes before the garment. You can't have a dress made out of a certain fabric if that textile isn't available or desired within a particular culture. So the earliest garment in the historical group That's the brown wedding dress from around 1835, a British piece. And it's made from cotton, which flags up the huge demand for cotton dresses around this time in Western Europe. And during this earlier part of the century, this trade upsettingly relied heavily on enslaved labour in the US where the fibre was grown and processed. And looking further at the same dress, at the actual design on the textile, it features elements which resemble teardrops and they're usually called paisley in the UK and elsewhere. But these designs actually come from floral buta motifs, which were on imported textiles like cashmere shawls, and they were arriving in Europe often through colonial trade. So in and around the 19th century, this influx of goods connected to imperialism was really strongly impacting European fashion in terms of the textiles in particular. And then there's actually a real blend of culture influences on the textile for the slightly later Victorian dress with the bustle. That's dated to later in the 19th century. And we know this textile was printed in Britain, but it actually references Japanese Kamon family crests, which are circular. And it also has a lot in common with Sarasa, which is Indian chintz made for the Japanese market. Mm. And there was a particular interest in Japanese design in Britain in, you know, I think 1870s and 80s. That was in response to items from Japan being displayed at the International Exhibition of 1862 held in London. And while we're looking at 19th century textiles, you have to mention silk, even though we don't have a silk dress from this era on display. Hugely popular. And again, with the Western European market, it did rely really heavily on imported goods and ideas. And then to move into the 20th century, we have a lovely white dress on display in the exhibition. And that really highlights this love of light textiles. You know, they were light in terms of weight and also colour, so white lace, for example. And as well, a growing focus on synthetic textiles, which were increasingly being developed. And that's demonstrated in this group, perhaps in particular by the Paul Poiret dress that incorporates rayon. That was known as artificial silk, developed late 19th century, but really used more into the 20th. But having said that, kind of contradicting that, in the wartime era in Britain, France and elsewhere, that kind of brings to mind sturdy, homegrown types of textiles, like Scottish woolen tweed that we have on one of the pieces in the display. And then further still into the 60s, the typical experimental, unconventional, unusual textures and design. And for example, the last piece we have in historical display that's made from something called zibeline, which was a very stiff textile. Mm. And silhouettes and textiles are really linked. So that kind of structural 
kind of textile enables you to do those structural designs that were popular in that period. Often plastic was even being used to create these shapes. But shape was also influenced by factors including technology, social change. And I also think there's just a kind of ongoing desire for change. Mm -hmm. You know, that might be creative, personal and economic. It's economically advantageous for fashions to keep changing. And some examples from this grouping would be, so the skirt on the brown 1830s dress in this exhibition. It's not that wide, but then in terms of technological development that changed a fashion, around the 1850s, you get these cage crinolines developed. So they're structures underneath the skirt made of kind of springy sort of steel that allowed the skirts to get really enormous around the middle of the century. And then in terms of social change, in this group, I think the pink 1920s dress from Babani, that's a clear example. You know, these shorter hemlines, they've been associated with liberation and post-World War I celebration. And we do have a really nice range of silhouettes in this group. You know, we've got the classic puffy sleeves on the 1830s dress. Then we've got the large bustle silhouette for the later in the 19th century the 20s straighter lines with the shorter hemlines and then 50s almost looking back to the 19th century and that's just to name a few of the many silhouettes we're showing here. Even today, right, so much of fashion begins at the textile level. And to me, that's one of the more interesting things that this exhibition tells us, right, is the story of trends and status and desirability with textiles. And you had mentioned that 1885 day dress that emulates a Japanese kamon with family crests. And so can you speak to the relationship and evolution of fashion in terms of where that desirability came from? Like, where did trends come from? Where was the genesis of the desirability for, you know, this Japanese influence to cotton being seen as a covetable luxury fabric, whereas today it's very accessible? This has happened for a very long time, but goods were really rapidly moving around the world in the 19th century with kind of transport links improving, etc., and also in connection with imperialism. And so often these imported goods were seen as something different, something that people really wanted. That definitely often was inspiring design uh, in Western Europe, certainly. Cotton, for example, was not being necessarily grown, but was being woven up often in the UK. And so there's a kind of push of, okay, we're making this textile here. Let's get it in the fashion press because that will be good for the economy. So I think partly it's visual and what people like and it's connected to social trends. But there are definitely also connections with labour and economics and imports and all the kind of economics around it. So I think it's a real blend of social and the creative and the more economic. In addition to those factors that you just mentioned, are there any additional things that fashion specifically can tell us about a historical time period that other materials like books or records or music cannot? I think there's a very human element is often left behind with fashion. So whether that be a stitch might be out of place, perhaps sweat marks on a garment, even a rip in a skirt caused by a high heel, for example. And those really physical manifestations of people, I think that offers a real sense of closeness with everyone from makers to the wearers. And then to see the question from another direction, I actually have a background in literature as well as dress. And so I kind of like to bring these sources together. So an example would be Jane Austen novel, Pride and Prejudice. The character Lydia Bennett, she buys this bonnet and she actually decides she thinks it's quite ugly. And she says something like that she's going to pull it to pieces at home and redo the decoration. And I think that kind of detail can really bring life to the physical artifact. So, you know, if you're then looking at the bonnet from the early 19th century when this book was set, If it looks a little handmade or something's changed, you know, this kind of brings a bit of explanation to that. And then vice versa, if you're studying the novel and you can actually see it alongside a physical example, I think that also enriches it from the other direction. You know, we have a hat also in the exhibition. We do mainly have garments, but we do have gloves and a hat as well. And it's covered in decoration. It's got pins, artificial flowers, lace, etc., It's always interesting with hats like that to really investigate and see, does this look like it's been manipulated? Has the wearer intervened and put their own mark on something? I think fashion definitely brings its own elements, but it's also really beneficial to kind of mix sources. 
Of course, you know, we're talking about a time when ready to wear didn't exist. And that's what true couture is. And that's what a lot of couturiers did. So could you walk me through that process of how someone in the 19th century in Britain would order a piece of custom made clothing? Like how would they choose the material or the tailoring or, or the color? Well, the first thing I guess to flag is that mass production and ready to wear kind of came maybe a bit earlier than we often think. So it was starting to be introduced in the 19th century, particularly more so for items that were a bit more uniform and a bit more perhaps simple shapes like shirts. So around mid century, you know, 1850s in Britain and elsewhere, we were starting to see that come about. Right. There was Brooks Brothers in New York, I think, in 1881. Exactly. So it was starting to filter through. But yeah, became hugely more prominent end of the century into the 20th. So often people were working in this much more like couture bespoke way as more of a standard. In terms of inspiration, I think people would have looked at those around them, you know, particularly in fashionable locations, Paris and London, for example. And also, I mentioned the fashion press before, periodicals would have been a source of inspiration, you know, what we would now call fashion magazines. And there were only a handful of these at the start of the 19th century in Britain, but then thousands by the 20th century. So that sector is just hugely developing. And just as a side note, they're really helpful for dress historians like myself when it comes to dating historical dress, because they can pinpoint this particular ruffle or flounce was popular, this one or two year range. So we can get much more specific than a whole decade, for example. And as well, I think Victorians would have taken advice from people like dressmakers, people in the fashion industry. And then the process. You would have often have purchased fabric from a shop called a draper's and then taken that material to your dressmaker. Or as well, actually, dresses were made up at home, possibly by the wearer or someone they employed in their household. And then in the latter half of the century, in terms of couture options, when major designers like Charles Frederick Worth, the Englishman in Paris, were offering collections more like today, another option would have been to choose a design that you saw You might have seen it modelled on a person that was starting to happen, or you might have seen it illustrated. And then you could request tweaks, like you could request it in your favourite colour or a longer or a shorter sleeve, something like that. In terms of looking aside from mass production, in terms of these more couture bespoke options, there were various different ways of doing it and they kind of grew over time. Of course, as ready to wear was spreading, you know, I think a lot of people aren't aware that as far back as Elizabethan England, like secondhand shops existed yes, and a lot of them definitely. did exist because of couturiers. And that was a way of, you know, making these one of a kind pieces accessible as well as feeding that need for newness for this new class of couture customer. Can you speak to me a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the secondhand trade was really huge in this era that we're talking about. It doesn't always get brought up and it is a really big factor. But something else to bear in mind is that people would be getting rid of their items if they wanted to upgrade and get something of a different silhouette. But often the pieces bought secondhand, you know, the new owner could sometimes alter them to make them more in line with the fashionable silhouette. So, you know, it was often still possible to keep up with trends. However, there were certain eras when the silhouette changed drastically, when that became a lot harder. So say the skirt suddenly becomes a lot fuller, you can't suddenly edit the piece in the same way you could kind of reduce a sleeve, for example, if the fashion changed in that direction. So yeah, it's a really interesting topic. Thank you for bringing it up. The reason I am talking about that is because it reminds me of that Simpsons episode, right? Where Marge Simpson buys a Chanel dress at a secondhand shop and she ends up, as you said, you know, really tailoring it to different outfits depending on the fashions of the time. And it's a big plot point. But I think it also reflects the modern culture around sort of shops and secondhand, but is a nice precursor to my next question, which is about people's personal relationships with fashion Mm -hmm. and how they sort of change over time, the rise of mass production and ready to wear clothing. How do people view clothes differently now than they did back then when, you know, frankly, they didn't have as many clothes? Another interesting point, almost a side note before I actually answer the question, sorry about that. You know, even before mass production and ready to wear, clothing kind of wasn't always as unique as we might think. So maybe the clearest example would be paper sewing patterns. And they were widely produced from around the middle of the 19th century in Britain. So even though the clothing wasn't being mass produced and available in department stores early on, you could absolutely walk down the street and see someone with the same design because you both use the same pattern. So I just think that's really interesting. But yes, I mean, clothing being so much more readily available now, there has to be, I think, a different relationship unless you were from the very wealthiest sector of society. 
women had to think about practicality and about versatility in 19th century Britain and France. As an example, they would have expected to wear their wedding dress on other occasions. It wasn't often a kind of show-stopping white dress that was just worn once and put away. But people often would have made a choice that they could have worn again and again. Whereas choices, I think, can be led really largely by fashion if clothing is affordable and easily available. So yeah, maybe less less stress around something like a bad stain if you know that item can be readily replaced even with the exact same thing. Of course, fashion is heavily influenced by social and cultural changes, but how does it inform society in turn? Can you think of one instance of social change that's occurred as a result of a shift in fashion? I think it is usually quite chicken or the egg in the sense of things happening in sync. But certainly, yeah, at times of great social change, there definitely tends to be an accompanying radical shift in the fashion. So like take the celebratory post-war 1920s, the fun beaded dresses that were being worn with the shorter hemlines. And another kind of classic example, the so-called swinging 60s with fashion and society breaking away from the traditional 1950s Something else actually that I find really interesting is that these fashion revolutions, they kind of often look back in time as well as forward. So I think to show you're not satisfied with what's going on around you, you can either look kind of to the future, make something avant-garde, or you can look back instead to the past. For example, there was a group of people often referred to as artistic or aesthetic dress reformers working in late 19th century Britain. And they were living really alternatively often and also trying to break away from conventional fashion as well. And they were taking inspiration from earlier periods like ancient Greece, medieval England, they're two examples. So perhaps they would have created a dress that in some ways resembled a typical Victorian dress, but it was more flowing, made of a pale fabric, kind of really resembled something like an ancient Greek chiton that would have been worn, you know, centuries earlier. So yeah, I think this is a really, really interesting topic and really such strong connections between social change and fashion. So do you think it's our relationship to fashion that determines its value? Or do you think that there's an inherent objective value in fashion? I would say both, really. You know, looking at the amazing designs, the intricate handiwork on show in the K11 Love of Couture exhibition, I think it's hard to argue against the concept of fashion as art. Take the heavily embellished YSL for Dior dress, the 1960s one from the V&A, and also the Miss Sohi response by Sohi Park, the gown with the lovely sequin butterflies applied on the bodice, I think really exemplify that idea. But at the same time, you know, designers, I do think they've tended to be designing with the wearer in mind. And those of us more in the business of putting dresses on mannequins and putting some text next to them, I think it's good to keep that in mind. And from the museum's point of view, the stories about how a piece was chosen, how it was worn, etc., that really enriches the picture. And I do think there's an increasing focus these days on these human stories behind fashion, from designers and makers to the wearers and the later owners. And these stories, they can be uplifting, but also problematic. And that's something we felt it was important to bring out in the exhibition text, which acknowledges issues like labour conditions and ties to colonialism. So yeah, going back to this term value, I think while pieces of dress history and contemporary design are completely valuable, I think it's also good to flag that, you know, it's not always a straightforward or entirely positive story. There's complexities woven into the textiles and the garments. Is there a specific moment in fashion history that deeply impacted you? Judging from your work, specifically in the Victorian era and the British New Woman, I'm thinking it's somewhere along those lines. <laughs> yeah, that's a good guess. And there are many as well. Being so lucky to work at the V&A, you're kind of constantly seeing amazing and interesting things. Going back, as a girl, I remember being really obsessed with the 1960s. Maybe the colour, the fun and the revolutionary aspect all appealed. But yes, more recently, it was my doctorate focusing a lot on Victorian dress reform that got me really interested in dress history and dresses connections with topics like gender, feminism, socialism. To elaborate a bit more on that, this reform movement, it had two branches. There was one that was usually referred to as the rational dress movement, and that was very closely connected to the feminism of the day in the 1890s. And there was a particular interest in trousers, cycling, things like that. And then the other branch was the artistic or aesthetic dress reform movement. And there were really strong ties there, sometimes idealised ties, because the clothing wasn't actually always very accessible to socialism. And then projects I've been working on recently, they've often highlighted the processes that lead to fashion around things like labour conditions, etc. So I do have lots of interest, but 
I think there's a bit of a connecting theme of these intersections between fashion and wider cultural topics. Can you think of a specific turning point when couture helped establish and evolved to haute couture? So if we're really looking to kind of define these terms, couture without the word haute is a broad term, really. So I guess it's about making a piece to a client's specific requests, their specific measurements, as we've been discussing. That's something that's happened for centuries and also all over the world. And then speaking very strictly, haute couture, that refers to clothing made by French couture houses under guidelines set down by an institution which has actually had various names, but it's often called the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture. And it was founded in the 1860s. But it wasn't then until the 1940s, so, you know, nearly 100 years later, that the specifications for what that group of people deemed Haute Couture to be were officially publicly outlined. So it's from that day onwards that it becomes easier to really define what falls under the official Haute Couture banner. And as an example of a specification, you needed to have one or more fittings with private clients. So I guess it was emphasizing that one-on-one relationship between the designer and the client. One of my favorite films depicts a British haute couturier, Phantom Thread, with Daniel Day-Lewis. fascinating. And so I'm just wondering about the historical accuracy of him running an haute couturier in Britain as a historian, if there was anything you noticed they got specifically right or they got inaccurate. It was before my time, but I think there were some connections. I think research was very much being done by those involved in the production, possibly even with the V&A. Like I say, it was from before my time, but I do get the feeling really a lot of research went into that film. It had a lovely focus on the dressmakers as well as the designer. If memory serves me correctly, I think it was a really strikingly accurate depiction. Why do you think people are still drawn to couture and the idea of haute couture as well? It's probably different for different people, often maybe a mixture of factors. I think some people, there's a close relationship with a particular designer and maybe they feel that their visions sort of come together to create something expressive of both personalities. So we have in the exhibition, there's a yellow Charles James dress And it was worn by the artist Marek Guinness Ashan when she was a young woman. And she would actually go on to be a long-term supporter of this designer. So often there is this kind of ongoing personal relationship. And then for other people, I think maybe it's more about enjoying and celebrating someone else's creative genius and the artisanship that goes into the pieces. And also just the element of something being made just for you, you know, how special that would be. And in some cultures, that's a rare thing and it's linked perhaps to status, but elsewhere, custom made clothing it really is more of a norm. And that's an idea we explore in the V&A's current exhibition, Africa Fashion, with couture approach being so central to fashion production in Africa. So I think lots of draws to couture, both historically and they really kind of the same draws really that exist now, different for different people, different times, different places. Now, of course, there's many legendary couturiers and creative geniuses like Christian Dior, Vivian Westwood, who often draw inspiration from past styles. And I think the exhibit shows how, let's say, in the 1930s to 40s, right, suits became a well of inspiration for things like woolen suits or silk dresses, things like that. How do these couturiers really draw inspiration from the past and recontextualize them for the time of their new era? That's really relevant to the exhibition, which of course looks at historical pieces and we've invited contemporary designers to use them as inspiration. Dior, who you mentioned, is a really classic example. The cinched waists, the really full skirts, hugely influenced by 19th century Western European fashions. I think it was about nostalgia and also about escaping the wartime austerity that Dior had just been coming out of. And then the clearest example of this phenomenon within the V&A group of objects at K11 would be the Charles James dress. So James is often really more associated with avant-garde design, for example, his striking cloverleaf dress. But this dress in the exhibition, it it speaks instead to a different facet of him, his historicism. So the dress is called Le Sylphied, and that comes from 19th century French ballet. And then if we look at the piece itself, the skirt is 
quite full, really unusually full for 1930s when these bias cut really slinky dresses. That was the main dominant fashion in Britain and France. And then if we also look at the waistband of this dress, it's actually inspired by a very specific corsetry style from 1860s in Britain. It's these underbust corsets, often made of kind of shiny silk satin. And then it's really lovely that this particular piece I've been talking about is inspiring contemporary designers featured in this exhibition. So I think two pieces are connected back to this Charles James. We've got the window sen pink and black dress by Sen Sen Lee, and that references the juxtaposition of textures seen on the Charles James. So on the James dress, we have like a soft organza, and then that contrasts with the shiny satin waistband. And then on the window sen look, there's the shiny pink part of the dress, but sequined, I think, and that contrasts with the soft tool of the bottom of the skirt. And then Yuki Ki was also inspired by the fabric of the James dress, its softness in particular, for one of her looks. So fashion is always circling back, and that's a major theme for this exhibition. Now, in mentioning Sen Sen Lee, that brings us full circle. His corsetry is reminiscent of Victorian-era corsets, which were at times made with unexpected materials, such as whale bones. And so in what ways is couture really just a way to push the limits and innovation of materials and silhouettes, even going up to recent collections by Caperni with a spray dress on Bella Hadid. You know, there can sometimes be a temptation to look more at the end product, the end look, but so much of fashion, particularly these more kind of avant-garde, pushing the boundaries designs, are really made possible through technological innovations and textile or, you know, like with the spray on example, not even necessarily textile, you know, what's possible with the technology of the day. We even have metaverse fashion as well. That's a whole different realm to think about. So I think it's really important to look at what comes before the actual garment. And so often that's so tied to technological innovations. So as a curator, how do you draw connections between clothing from different areas? Like, How do you evaluate where that inspiration comes from when sort of looking at different historical garments? Like I mentioned before about periodicals, we can really pinpoint when a particular fashion came from. And there, these fashion magazines, I'm sure many designers use those as well as historical garments because they offer so much access to dresses and other garments from the past. So there's such a wealth of information to draw from. And then when it does come to drawing inspiration from the past, I think it's most successful really when the past is given a modern twist unique to that designer. I do think inspiration and originality can go hand in hand. Like one example that comes to mind from the display we're talking about today is a Yuki Ki design, which references, I believe it's the Digby Morton suit dress. Got lots of tailoring, but then it also has safety pins. And that's a reference to Yuki Ki's husband, who's in the world of rock music. So that's a nice example of drawing inspiration from the past, but bringing in something more modern and, you know, very personal to that particular designer. And one thing you had mentioned that I had been meaning to ask about is the fashion press. And when was that established and how did it change the status symbols, sort of which couturiers were elevated and how people were informed about fashion and really consumed it, not necessarily from a transactional way, but from a knowledgeable way? So I can speak more specifically to the British market of magazines. That's what I know more about. So my impression is that the magazines really started to emerge around the beginning of the 19th century, didn't really exist much before that. And there were just a handful initially, and they would have been not hugely accessible, elaborate plates with the designs, this wouldn't have been accessible to everyone. And then again, technology coming in again, you know, as the printing press develops, as the transport links develop, it becomes easier and cheaper to make more of these magazines. Also, literacy rates are going up. So magazines in general are being more widely purchased and read. The market for magazines really takes off throughout the 19th century. And then there are hundreds, thousands by the 20th century. And I think designers' relationship with it kind of varied and maybe changed over the period. You know, I have heard of designers who didn't want to feature very much in these papers. They wanted to be so exclusive that you had to go and visit that couturier. Whereas other people were, you know, a bit savvy to the marketing and thought this was a great idea. So I think attitudes changed in the modern perspective. I don't think people would be thinking, oh, I wouldn't want to be featured in a wonderful fashion magazine. But, you know, certainly some people held that view at the time. So it's really the 
time when that is all getting developed and views around it are all changing and they're becoming more accessible to a wider market. Lastly, are there any historical or vintage styles that you hope to see revived? Is there anything you hope to see more of in the future of fashion? Sustainability needs to be a central focus going forwards as the industry is increasingly becoming aware of. And actually looking to the past, which was often unintentionally more sustainable, can be really useful for that. So if we're thinking about slower production before mass production was possible and use of natural fibres before synthetic ones have been developed, that took off more in the early 20th century. We can kind of take inspiration from the sort of unintentional sustainability of aspects of the past. And I think it's great that the contemporary designers featured in the Love of Couture exhibition have this in mind. So I know there's a real sense of valuing the slow pace of couture and making decisions like Tomo Koizumi, for example, uses mostly dead stock fabric. So taking something that might have gone unused and giving it a new life. So I'm not alone in, of course, thinking that this is something really crucial and that we can look to the past for inspiration. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Claire Allen Johnstone, for taking some time. This has been great. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to chat to you. K11 Conversations is produced by Sonia Manalili and hosted by me, Gian DeLeon. Special thanks to our guest, Dr. Claire Allen Johnstone. Stay tuned for future episodes. <laughs>